This is Lisa McDonald, Trustee McDonald, and I'm here to call the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees virtual meeting to order for July 21st at 6.01 p.m. May we have a roll call, please, Trustee mm -hmm. Barshis? Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fitman? Yes, A, here. Trustee Johnson? Here. Trustee Riddle? Trustee Rogers? Here. Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. And Trustee Riddle on yet? No. Okay. Okay. Anthony, do you want to take the roll call of those who are visiting us today? Sure. I see that we have two representatives from the League of Women Voters. I see Georgia Gebhardt and Mary Lawler. Thank you for being with us. And I also see three staff members. I see Gail Justman, Marty Belfontaine, and John Risco. Thank you. And myself. <laughs> Good to acknowledge. Okay. Right now, this is a session where we have public comment. Does anyone have anything that they would like to comment that who are visiting us today? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. You have got the draft of the June 23rd minutes. May we have a motion to adopt the minute? I motion we adopt the uh, June 2020 minutes. Okay. Our second. Okay, Trustee Wolf has moved that we adopt the June 23rd minutes and Trustee Barshish has seconded it. Any discussion regarding the meeting minutes? Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshish? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. And Trustee McDonald. Aye. Okay. Given that there are no presentations, let's move with Trustee Rogers to the Treasurer's Report. Okay, you have the, um, the notes on financial reports in your um, materials for the meeting. Uh, during the month of June, we received a little over $50,000 under the Kenilworth contract. Um, 10,000 in fund, uh, general fund interest and about $11,000 in grants. Um, our um, end of year expenses as of June 30th uh, were at 91% of budget. Uh, there may be some additional expenses that come in uh, for the past fiscal year, but I think that's probably in the process of being closed up. Our major expenses during the month were for insurance uh, and materials. Um, and so there's there's nothing extraordinary uh, in this financial report. It's pretty much what we expected it to be. Um, the only action that we need to take is approval of the June bills and salaries. Um, I so move. I will second. You're muted, Lisa. Thank you. Trustee Rogers has moved for the uh, approval of the bills and salaries for the month of June 2020, and Trustee Wolf has seconded it. May we have, is there any question no. or discussion? Okay, it's been- I, I, I have a question about the general report, but I can wait till after the motion if you'd like. Oh, the motion's been done. So do you have any regarding the June report? I, I just want to, my question was, is does Anthony or anyone else expect us to spend more than 91% of budget or do we expect we'll have, you know, the equivalent of a 9% surplus? Um, I think we've got all of our expenses in for the year. Okay, so, so we spent uh, just around 91% of what we budgeted? Um, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Been moved and seconded. Is can we now have a vote for the approval of the June twenty financial bills and salary report? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barsha. 
Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? I'll vote no. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. It's been moved and adopted by, with all saying, well, whatever the vote, we've got the vote recorded. Okay, moving right along. We now have uh, action item uh, for ordinance number 2020-21-197. Would you like to discuss it, Trustee Rogers? Uh, yes. Um we could start by with a motion and then have the discussion okay. following that. Um, I move approval of ordinance 2020-21-197. Uh, the tentative combined annual budget and appropriation ordinance. I will second it. Uh, there is, excuse me, there is one correction and that is regarding the number that was listed. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I should have said that before. And this is where I, I think I say it, but it's with the, um, find it. There's a, a number that is, needs to be updated as that refers to the reference number. And it's on section six. Number D with an asterisk after at the at the bottom of that section and instead of C resolution 2017-18-192, it should read 2018-19-201. So I, I just want to bring that to light. And so with that exception, do you want to restate that motion, Trustee Rogers? Or you want me to? And you let me know, Madam President, when the time for questions are, please. Okay. Um, base, well, we can amend the motion uh, to reflect um, the correction in the reference to the ordinance. Um, that can be recorded in the minutes. Thanks. And, it's, it's, thank and uh, I think that needs to be affirmed by the seconder. I will, I will second again. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> second. Thank you. Trustee Rogers to approve uh, ordinance to, pub, uh, to publish the budget and appropriation ordinance number 2020-21-197 with uh, the correction that was stated. Is there a discussion? I think you had some trustee. Okay, basically, just to fill in some information, uh, the tentative budget and appropriation ordinance um, is in the calendar to be approved tonight so that it can be published in preparation for the required public hearing um, prior to the August board meeting. Uh, so this is not the final uh, adoption. This represents um, preparing the information uh, for the tentative ordinance so that it can be published. Um, we still have an opportunity to make amendments um, uh, prior to adoption. Uh, typically, we, uh, we act on this for final purposes um, in August. It could, however, if absolutely necessary, be extended to September. Um, what follows this then is the levy, which we adopt in the fall. Um, this ordinance um, uh, reflects the recommendation of the Finance Committee, um, and it is uh, needless to say, under the circumstances that we've been dealing with this year, it represents our best um, estimate or the staff's best estimate of uh, how we should proceed in what is clearly uh, an uncertain period of time. 
Uh, there are things that we're looking at that um, no library or uh, has dealt with in the past. We've not had a pandemic of, of any magnitude um, uh, during my time on this board uh, until now. And so, you know, this represents um, uh, a, uh, you know, the necessary steps for us to have the authority to proceed with library operations. It's also important to recognize that the appropriations authorize expenditures which we may not make if we don't need to do so. So the issue here is that the appropriation is necessary in order to provide the board with the authority to spend if necessary. Uh, this is not a commitment to spend all of the money that is designated in this ordinance. So that's another important issue. Um, and, and so, um, you know, with that, I think we can, uh, uh, Anthony, if you have anything you want to add before we open it up to questions, um, I have a good time to do so. I have something. We voted on this budget last month. So it has been voted on. And so this is, that's all I wanted to say, because it has been voted on the budget, but we have not voted to uh, spend the money and to allocate that money for the expenditure. Anthony? Um, yeah, so um, to the point of the um, amended motion at the top of, of our conversation on the appropriation ordinance, um, the ordinance um, is referencing presently, the tentative ordinance is referencing resolution 2017-18, uh, resolution amending a plan, the special reserve fund plan. Um, that date is older. We have a newer version of that that was approved last June, uh, and that is the, the number that um, was provided in the amended motion. Um, just for everyone's um, memory, um, the library did last fall um, go into agreement with Ingrid Anderson Architects to, to complete a capital reserve study. Um, that study um, is nearing completion. We've received a draft um, version of that report. And um, we um, are going to be scheduling a meeting in advance. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of chatter here. One second. Um, we're, um, we're going to be having a meeting in advance of our August meeting. So when we approve the BNA at next month's meeting, the week prior to that, we will have a special meeting where we will meet with um, Joe Huberty from Ingberg Anderson, and he will um, uh, provide us an overview of that document, which will help to inform the next version of the resolution amending a plan, the special reserve fund plan. And that is why in June, we did not um, present or approve um, an updated version of that resolution. And therefore, we are referencing last year's version. Um, it still remains true and contains the same content as what we've looked at in the past. Um, I anticipate that this next version that we're going to be making will be more inclusive and will have updated estimates and uh, certainly more detail than what we've been um, providing in recent years. But I wanted to make sure that we had that, that bit recorded um, because that is a, a key distinction um, in this. Any, any questions, comments, discussion about uh, the content of the BNA? Yes, please. May I? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, uh, is this a how? Is this the same as last year? Is it an increase over last year's? Um, well, the same methodology was applied to uh, this year's proposal as was last, as is reflected in the, the, uh, the cover pages that um, are in front of the BNA that you're looking at this evening. We use the same methodology that we did last year and as recommended by our attorney. So um, is, it the, is the bottom line number larger, the same, or smaller than last year's? Um, it's essentially the same. Okay. Um, and so if we have a 9%, you know, surplus or didn't spend or whatever the term is of four or $500,000 ish, uh, do we want to account for that in this year's budget or we anticipate only spending 91% of this budget or uh, how, how are we thinking about that? Yeah, so um, a, a key piece to remember about the budget and appropriation ordinance is that it is an authorization to spend the budget. It is not the budget. The budget was approved at last month's meeting. Um, what we're looking at here is um, the authorization, the legal authority to be able to spend 
uh, the resources that we receive. Uh, so, um, you know, that what we're looking at here is, is simply a reflection of the numbers that we incorporated from the budget from last month, and that is built into this document. Um, the, the places where it deviates a little bit are, are um, the two areas that I indicated in my cover pages, which were the same as what we did last year, and those are uh, grants. Um, in the event that the library applies for a grant and receives it, we need to be able to be authorized to expend those revenues. So we have um, raised that, the, uh, the grant line a little bit so that we can account for any grants that we might receive. Um, as you see in the um, uh, treasurer's report this month, we did in fact receive some grant money in, uh, in June. And so because we appropriated for that, we are able to, to spend that. Um, the other line is health insurance. And we know that in the middle of a pandemic that there's a lot of variables that are involved in that. And we expect that um, when we receive our quote in January of 21, that there will likely be an increase in that. We can't estimate what that is right now, but we figure about a 10% increase over what our expenditures were last year is a reasonable estimate for what we should be um, appropriating for this line so that we can uh, cover the, the second half of the fiscal year. So those are the two areas that really deviate um, and, and that follows the same formula that we did for last year's appropriation. Okay, last one for me is that if, um you know, this year is anything like the last years, it's a reasonable assumption that we'll spend in the low 90s of what we uh, are asked to approve tonight. So that at this time next year, we'll likely have the same sort of surplus. Is that a reasonable assumption to make? Well, when the library passed the, the budget last month, we proposed a budget that we think we, um, for the expenses that we feel that we need to operate which was the same case back in June of 2019 when we passed this budget that we got close to 92% uh, with. And um, you know, I, I think given the fact that the library was closed for four months and um, you know, honestly, I'm kind of proud of the fact that we got to 92% um, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I, I think that we were able to maintain our revenues fairly well. We did a good job of estimating what they were gonna be and the staff delivered. So um, again, I feel like what we proposed last month and what we discussed uh, with the proposed budget, there are a lot of modifications, a lot of lines were adjusted. The bottom line was essentially the same. We moved things around uh, to try to account for what we think is gonna be coming up. But there are so many variables that I think are difficult to, to assess and predict. Um, but I think with our reasonable estimates, yes. Um, what we passed last month, I think is a reasonable budget that will sustain um, and maintain the library services for this coming fiscal year. So I, I you know, our, our goal is always to, to get as close to 100% and not to, and not to budget any more than what we think we're going to need. And um, I think in, in the last two years, we've demonstrated that we've gotten much closer than, than we have in years past. Thank you very much. Any other questions about the appropriation? Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Wolf, Wolf. <laughs> to a motion to publish the BNA ordinance to approve the tentative BNA uh, budget. And we have a roll call. Uh, Jan, you're muted. Uh, Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Sorry. Roger? Sorry, Trustee. Uh, Ron, you're muted. Uh. Yes. Okay. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. And right now it's been the motion, uh, the motion one. So right now we have uh, a contract approval for the HVAC preventative maintenance agreement. Trustee Austin, Director Austin, yep. would like to talk a bit about uh, this contract for the HVAC system. Sure. Um, so Hill Mechanical has been the library's HVAC contractor since um, we went out for uh, public bid in 2015. 
Um, their expenses have been flat since, and um, we are, are really satisfied with the technician that's been serving us. Um, he has been incredibly responsive. Um, this contract um, is, uh, I think, one of the one of the key hallmarks of, of being able to maintain our operations and uh, keeping the building up, up and running. So. Um, we're, we're satisfied with Hill Mechanical, and um, I think we will, we will likely want to go out for public bid at some point here in the near future again, but I think for this coming fiscal year, we're satisfied and would like to recommend that uh, you approve uh, the contract that's before you um, for us to continue for one more year. And I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is it discussion time, Madam President? Oh, we need to put the motion on the table. We need to put the motion. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the contract with Hill Mechanical for um, uh, preventive maintenance, maintenance services uh, in an amount not to exceed um, $26,500. I'll second. Sec okay. Trustee Fishman seconded it. Discussion? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Fishman to adopt the uh, contract by the Hill Group for the HVAC system to uh, maintain the HVAC system for 12 months and not to exceed 26,500. Can we have the roll call? Trustee Garson? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. And the motion passed. Thank you. Okay. Well, discussion, some good news. If you've not seen the website, Trustee Rogers has been named Illinois trustee of the year oh. it will be virtual and thank you and so you can see it and to highlight it basically it's an annual citation is awarded to a public library trustee for achievement leadership and service to libraries and trustee Rogers has been on the board since 1984 he served on almost every committee and he's responsible for the expansion that almost tripled what the library was. And I think also his actions with the North Suburban Library System was another reason in terms of what his service was. But we were able to get the um support documents from two, three of the uh, directors that served as well as from former board Kathleen O'Loughlin. So it'll be a virtual <laughs> service and so for a much well-deserved honor. So you all put your little hands up and so congratulations. Thank you. Nice picture too. I like yeah, that. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Ron, is there some reason I didn't see it in the ILA report? Would they have had it in there? No, it was just it announced today. Yesterday. Okay. Okay. Damn. They had a press release yesterday, and they will probably have more information posted uh, coming up. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Okay. And next is session. I might have lost all my little papers. are all messed up. Uh oh. Also oh, here. Too much. Okay, well, the next item on the agenda is um, item A under discussion items, and this is our chapter review for serving our public 4.0. Um, this is the standards for Illinois Public Libraries. In this chapter, chapter 8 refers to system member responsibilities and resource sharing. And um, to kind of piggyback of, uh, of what uh, Lisa just said, um, Wilmot Library has been very active in system membership um, for years. Uh, dating back to the NSLS system. Um, we have very fond memories of the North Suburban Library System and our affiliation there. Rob obviously was very active in, in that um, and as part of the Literary Circle programs in particular. Um, 
Uh, our participation as Wilmet Library has been very strong with NSLS historically and it continues with, uh, with Rails. Um, Ron served as part of the Public Policy Committee and I just ended my tenure on Public Policy Committee this past month. Um, so we have, we have maintained active memberships um, in committee work as well as maintaining the library's membership and full participation in uh, various meetings. Um, we also fulfill all of our responsibilities as part of ILL. Um, we're, we're actively one of the, the strongest users, one of the strongest borrowers and lenders of um, interlibrary loan services. Um, so when it comes to um, our participation within the guidelines uh, that are set within here, again, we, we meet and exceed um, all the recommendations. Um, we are also a full member of CCS and uh, a fully participative member of CCS. Um, so I, I think, I, I guess I would just reiterate that it, when you look at that checklist on the back, that we meet, we meet all the criteria. Um, for each of those. I, I, I don't know if you want to go into much more detail about this. This one was a little bit more boilerplate, but if there's any questions that you've got about resource sharing, about our, our role and relationship with Rails or CCS, I would be more than happy to get into those details with you all. But once again, happy to see that we continue to, uh, to either meet or exceed these standards. Okay, you want to give your director's uh, review and update the pandemic response and reopening plan? Okay. I have to say, I felt very safe and everything was well laid out and spaced out when I came to visit, and it was so good to come. Yeah. Okay. So I know that I've seen a few of you here, so, um, you know, for anyone who has been in the library since, um, or have been on site since um, we have reopened here in July, um, would you like to give any uh, testimonials or any, any thoughts on what your experience was? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I'd say, you know, very calm. Everyone seemed, you know, in control of what was going on. The plexiglass is, is very reassuring. Um, as Lisa said, the spots on the floor were great. I used... Um, the self checkout, which was very easy, convenient, and and you know went some very smoothly. So you know I wasn't um, I didn't linger, but um, I felt like I, the time I spent was uh, just right. And um, so everyone, I didn't go upstairs, but um, I I'm sure it was the same. And I liked that you were counting and allow and you know, continuing to keep tabs on how many people are entering the building at one, would be there at one time. So that's very reassuring. Signage was good. Um, I, I always think signage is, is, is excellent, you know, so looking good. I was very pleased. Thank you. It was, I, I liked having the, uh, seeing the book drop at the front door. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it made, uh, a statement, you know, people would stop to ask what that is, or do I put my book there, or whatever. And it was kind of welcoming, rather than have it go away in the back and dump it in a, or something out there. And it gave it gave the patron time if he or she had a question, he could ask it right there and then he'd get it answered. And I agree with Joan; everything looked set up very, very well, and uh, looked like people obeying what they should. Well, thank you. Thanks for the overview and, and for coming in and checking it out. Um, so I want to give you some uh, some overviews. Um, uh, first, I, I guess what I'd like to do first is to show you um, our screen that kind of outlines what our plan has been since we've been reopened. So I'm going to share this with you. This is currently on the website. Um, and this is our reopening plan. So since we moved into phase four, our plan was to reopen the facility and to implement some restrictions and general safety protocols and guidelines. So um, our expectation, our hours, we'll start with that, um, is, is a little reduced. Um, the hours of the public are 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and 10 to 3 on Saturdays. And we've been asking patrons who have been coming in to make their visits brief, to come in, to browse the collections, check out what they need, and take your items home to enjoy. 
Um, we're allowing computer use sessions for an hour. And if there are any, um, if, if folks need some modifications, we're working with folks on, a, on an as-needed as basis. Um, seating is rather limited, um, and we wanted to start that way just to see what our, what our attendance was. The capacity of the building is 50. Um, we have not met capacity yet. Um, at our busiest time, which was our first hour on Monday, uh, the 13th, the day that we reopened, um, we had nearly 40 people in the building at that time, and it got a little congested, um, primarily because, you know, I think as Joan noted, a lot of folks are primarily focusing on the first floor. That's where a lot of the activity is, the computers, the, the high interest collections and so on. And if you get 30 to 40 people that are congregating in a space like that, um, it, it certainly becomes a bottleneck and a bit of a challenge. So we are keeping track of how many folks are coming in the building. We have a security monitor at the front door who is keeping count. We also have a digital people counter as well that's verifying those numbers and we're keeping, we're keeping tabs on that throughout the day. Um, so as a result, we've had to limit some things. Um, anything that would prolong someone's use of the library and potentially um, create lines. As I said before, we have not reached capacity so there have been no lines. Um, but we do have a queue set up outside in the event that we do reach capacity um, in which case we would then ask folks to kind of move along and limit the time that they're in the building. So like I said, we've removed some seating. Um, we have limited the study rooms and meeting rooms presently. Um, when the, the, the time comes for us to, uh, to move forward and to expand some services, then we'll look at trying to offer some additional services in the future. But for right now, this is where we're at as we start week two. So our safety precautions are all done um, with an abundance of caution um, in reference to COVID. We're requiring masks for all patrons two and older and that face coverings must be worn over the mouth and nose at all times when you're in the library. Um, we really have not had any issues whatsoever with folks refusing to wear masks, which has been wonderful. Uh, folks are, are very compliant. Um, we are asking everyone to practice social distancing and try to maintain six feet of distance or greater at all times. Um, again, this has been generally um, well followed, except in, there are some times at the entrance where things can get congested. So we're evaluating that and seeing if there's something we can do with spacing, but by and large, we've generally been good there. As I said, our capacity is limited. Um, we have protective acrylic shields that are up at all of our service desks. Uh, this past week, I've been going through with the managers and we've been determining if we need to make any modifications to those. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is that our patrons love us so much that they wanna get close to us and they kind of try to come around the side of the barrier and, and uh, don't put the barrier between themselves and the staff. Um, that's really sweet, but um, we, need to, we need to keep that barrier between us. Uh, so we might actually be adding a return on a couple of the desks where we've got these barriers just to give that visual reminder that, hey, the idea is you're supposed to keep this thing between, between, uh, between people. Um, we're limiting the use of the elevators to single occupancy or single households, and that's generally gone really well. Um, the stair use uh, can be a bit of a, a tight space, but folks have been very good and just kind of wait at the landings um, to, so that folks don't cluster on the stairs. And um, I would say anecdotally that pretty much everyone who enters the building and leaves the building takes advantage of the hand sanitizer. So it's nice to know that folks have clean hands when they enter and when they leave. Um, and as before, we uh, continue to quarantine all the materials that were circulating uh, for a period of three days in reference to Rails, Rails's guidelines. So uh, in terms of the services that are available inside the library right now, um, Patrons have full access to the collections. Uh, you can check out books, movies, and music, and other resources. Um, pick up holds at the circulation desk. That's the default location for holds now. We did launch a new service in early July where we're making appointments in the parking lot, and that continues to be really popular. Um, so when folks get a holds notification that their material is available for them, they can then click on a link that allows them to schedule a time to come in and pick up. A lot of folks are doing that. Um, as I said earlier, you can browse the collections. Um, our professional reference and readers advisory services are available for children and adults. We've got our computer stations are open. Uh, our Wi-Fi access continues to be available. Um, we've also added four new access points for the Wi-Fi uh, within the last uh, month. Uh, this Wi-Fi now goes outside of the building. So the first few rows of the parking lot now have Wi-Fi coverage as does the lawn. 
Uh, so if folks want to take advantage of the nice weather and still use our Wi-Fi, they can do so. And the Wi-Fi is on 24-7. Uh, we are also offering uh, printing, scanning, and copying. As I said before, the seating is limited, um, but we do have a fair amount of seating still available throughout the library, particularly um, in some of the higher traffic corridors so that folks with mobility impairments have a place to rest for a period. Um, our, our outdoor book drops remain the primary point of returns, um, but it's true that um, right inside the door, as Jan noted, that we've got the book returns, uh, the book bins. Uh, there's one immediately inside the vestibule as well as one at the circulation desk. And um, our last request is that uh, if uh, folks are bringing children with them, that we ask them to keep the children with them at all times. Um, and that we're also extending the service that, hey, if you want to watch your kids, we'll help select the materials for you. Um, we just know that kids run off and they're maybe not as good at social distancing or keeping their masks on. And like I said before, everyone has been really, really compliant with our guidelines. So, um, a few things have been limited. As I said before, the study rooms are not available. We're not allowing room rentals right now, primarily because the room rentals, uh, those rooms are being occupied by other, other services right now. Because we have to quarantine, we've got thousands of items that are having to wait a few days before they can be processed. Um, we need a space to do that. So the auditorium is continuing to serve that purpose. Um, every delivery um, that we receive, the mail, um, various boxes, all the books that get returned, they all go to the, the auditorium for quarantine. Um, the periodicals room is currently closed. Um, magazines are holdable, but browsing magazines inside the library um, is currently not allowed. Um, there was some information that was provided earlier this week in the second report from the Realm study that indicates that the coronavirus may stand on magazines longer than some other services. Some other surfaces. Uh, Rails has not made any updates to their guidelines, but I think this is something that we're going to continue to study um, because it seems that magazines might potentially be a site of transmission, especially as they are an ephemeral. Um, and heavily used resource. We want to make sure that we're keeping those things sequestered, at least for the time being, until we know a little bit more about uh, the possible transmissibility of the virus through those items. Um, as before, we are not offering in-person in programming at least through September. Um, we are continuing to offer a whole variety of virtual programs, and we can get into that a little bit later, but they have been successful, and we're going to continue to offer that for folks. A lot of the interactives, toys, games, and so on have been removed from the floor um, in, in an effort primarily to keep people moving, but also because they're really hard to keep clean. Um, we're not allowing people to eat or drink in the library at this time, primarily because you can't do that if you're wearing a mask, um, we are, and we're asking people to keep their masks on. Um, the Friends are still... Um, um, not in operation at the library right now. So um, we're not accepting material donations. Again, for the primary reason is we, we just, we don't know about the transmissibility on materials and we wanna keep our, our volunteer staff um, healthy and safe. Uh, so the friends have elected to hold back a little while. So BDU remains closed and all the friends services are currently suspended. Um, we're, the off-site material returns are closed right now. Um, however, we're, we're evaluating the trending of our returns. Um, I think for, for right now, we're going to keep them closed a little while longer, but there's a possibility as our staffing model shifts and if our hours increase. Um, and after we, we have a chance to talk about something here in a moment that I'll discuss with you about resuming um, intra-library intra loans. Um, once we have a better sense for what our return rate is, we'll have a better sense for if we can keep the, the book drops open 24 seven and then reopen the remote ones. So TBD, uh, stay tuned. I think August is probably the time that we would be reevaluating um, our position on that matter. Uh, for now, the, the, um, the parking lot book drops and the ones inside the library are places where we're accepting returns. So this is kind of an overview of where we stand right now. Um, in this modified environment, this is, this is the library's current stage. The next stage would be to, um, if, if we continue to see that the, pan, the pandemic and, and local outbreaks have subsided, um, if we were to move forward and try to offer additional services, we would see a loosening of some of these restrictions. We would potentially see the capacity of the library rise. We would see some new services that would be relaunched. Um, rooms may become more available, that sort of thing. Um, so this is kind of where we're at in uh, the beginning of week two of having the facility reopened. 
Do you all have any questions about where we're at right now with the physical libraries opening? What percentage of your books would you say are still curbside pickup? Well, that's really shifted a lot in the last week. Um, I think primarily because folks are interested in seeing just what the public library looks like um, since it's been reopened. Uh, so the default location right now for all whole material is the circulation desk. Um, when patrons get receive that notice and they want to schedule an appointment, that morning we generate a report of uh, who, uh, who all the folks are that want to get their materials at the parking lot. Then we, we uh, check them out, bag them, and have them ready um, at the back door so that we can instantly drop them off when patrons arrive. At this time, I would say that it's probably about 20%. Um, but last week it was, it was more like 60%. So that's kind of where we're at. But again, we're, we're continuing to study that. I think folks are liking the ability to get back in the building, but we're still receiving a lot of positive feedback about the parking lot service. So much so that I think we're going to likely need to continue that even after the pandemic subsides. It's just a, a value added service. Other, other questions, comments, questions about uh, reopening? Um, what's the, you know, given the hard cap on occupancy, what's the percentage roughly of staff that are working? Uh, well, all staff are back to work. Um, we're on modified work schedules. The, the hours of the building are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So a lot of work that can't be done during open hours is being done outside of those hours. We still have some staff who are working remotely as well. Uh, a lot of the program planning, um, some collection development, um, remote customer service um, done via chat and email and so on um, is being conducted remotely. So um, we're trying to keep the capacity of the building at a manageable rate and trying to keep staff areas um, less populated if possible, um, but all staff are back to work. Are we at like the same hours of, you know, if we had close to zero, you know, a couple months ago, or we had 100% of, you know, a non-pandemic hourly spend these days, or are we sort of like at fewer hours, or are we sort of just back to normal in terms of staff spend? Um, are you talking about payroll? Yeah, yeah, just sort of the cost of running it, right, given that it's shrunk capacity did it did it impact our costs of running the library at all um i think it's still a little early to de determine um you know what what the cost is in terms of payroll because there are a lot of variables that are flexing at the moment um, we're experiencing about a 10 percent uh reduction in force right now due to retirements um i'll get into the, the staffing model here in a moment that's caused some challenges in terms of um, direct public service and some key positions have been vacated um, again, this is primarily due to retirements. Um, a few folks who worked evenings and weekend hours have had to modify their schedules. Um, so that's a little bit of a difference, but otherwise I would say we're right at where we would expect to be. Other, other questions? Uh, Jan, you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> if you look at your picture in the upper right hand corner, there's a little blue button. No, not yet. There you go. Okay. I can't see it, but what I did want to say, and I, I think I probably speak for all of us, is just to thank everybody, yourself included, for all the work and the plans and the development of plans that have helped keep our library going this time. It's been wonderful, and it's been wonderful to see, and... Uh, I think we're all very grateful for what you've done. Well, thank you, Jan, and I really appreciate all your support. Um, again, obviously, this is an unprecedented time. We've all had to kind of develop our own playbook and uh, make modifications as we've gone along, and I really have to applaud the staff. They've been very resilient. 
um, innovative at times and um, very, very much adapting to things as they shift in the moment. Um, and we continue to, and that's like I said, you know, that we're making changes every day to try to make things better. Uh, that's, that's kind of our mantra. So um, we're listening. If there's anything that you think that we can build upon or improve, um, let us know and, and we're gonna continue to do our best to make those changes. Okay, just be, be sure the staff knows. Thank you so much, Dan. I will pass that along. Let me take that opportunity then uh, as an idea for your staff to consider, because um, we're clearly gonna go into more e-learning uh, in the fall and winter at some capacity to the extent the, um, you know, child services folks can think about how they can be as much of a resource to families that are going to be grappling with e-learning as much as possible uh, and consider, you know, a more structured or formal relationship with D39 or Avoca uh, and probably the high school too, come to think of it. Um, there's, um, from the parents' perspective, there is a tidal wave of uh, need and frustration at navigating how to be a teacher and a working parent at the same time. And if we expect that the fall and winter outbreak will be worse than it was in the spring, that we can expect, hopefully it won't happen, but there may be months and months of it, uh, to the extent you guys can be thinking about how you can plug into that e-learning need, uh, that would be my suggestion for you to consider. Thank you, Dan. It's definitely on the forefront of our minds as well. I know the whole maker uh, movement was sort of shut down, but would it be a possibility to do maker kits that parents could pick up and then do virtual ma maker events? We're not supposed to be micromanaging, but I, I was just thinking of, you know, they could pick the kits up and then they could do the activities. Is that money? Yes. In fact, we've already done that. And we'll continue to grow upon that. Um, yes, we have STEAM kits that are available. Um, uh, there's a little bit of that in my report, um, but yes, definitely definitely um, take a look. They're, they're in our grab and go section uh, right at the beginning of the front of the library when you first come in. <laughs> and uh, Ruth, Ruth Bell has been a part of that process for us. Um, we're, yeah. They've been wildly popular. Does the public know about the extended Wi-Fi? How has that been publicized? So, I mean, it's good it's available, but are they aware of it? Um, I'm, I'm gonna say probably not, um, because we haven't done a press release about that. Um, I, I mean, we'll, I'll, look, I'll look into seeing how we might be able to better promote that. The, the challenge there is, you know, I, I think there could be potential diminishing returns the more that we publicize it. So I'd like to try to, to manage the, um, the access that we've got to it first and, and make sure that it's an appropriate solution before we try to more widely publicize it. So it's in a soft launch phase right now. And there is, there is a website that's dedicated to um, uh, pandemic services that libraries are offering, including an index of um, libraries that are offering remote Wi-Fi. And um, we're updating our content on that. So that will be another source of uh, publicity outside of our library that's done by a third party that will help folks connect, uh, help connect, connect folks with um, free internet access. Just quick follow up. Have you thought about or looked at the cost of expanding that, uh, you know, deeper outside or footprint at all? Uh, the answer is no, that's fine, just curious. Of course, of course we're looking at that. Um, the challenge is that we would have to completely upgrade our Wi-Fi system. Um, the, the system that we've got right now is um, at its end of life is no longer supported and we cannot purchase additional radios for it. So the new system actually requires additional radios, uh, more than we have currently. We would have to double the amount of radios, but it would provide broader coverage. Um, I'm certainly looking into that, and that will be part of a forthcoming iteration of the Capital Reserve Plan um, that we will try to budget for that um, in the next, like, two years, I think. But for right now, um, what we've got is an expanded network um, of radios that has been offered to us through CBI. Um, they've gotten them from some clients that have already upgraded their systems. And... Um, uh, I think this is, we're going to try this system out for a while and, and see how well this works for us. And if we need to expand it, you know, sooner than later, then we will uh, to try to meet demand. But for right now, I think this is a good start. We got a lot of other tech projects coming up this year too to, um, to look into. 
All right, anything else about uh, reopening that we wanna discuss? And we can certainly get into it a little bit more in my report. Betty, for your director report. Okay, all right, well, let's get into that. Um, can you check your voice? Cause it's coming through kind of tinny. It was coming through through my computer it was sort of tinny. I don't know if anybody else was experiencing that. All right. Anyone else having issues with that? I'm going to I'm going to ask you um, for this next portion to just mute yourselves. I think there's a bit of feedback. So I'm going to I'm going to mute the folks that were not muted. And Anthony, yeah, Anthony, yeah. I, I was, you, were, you were very tinny. Anthony, I'm going to mute myself again, but you were very tinny um, with with your voice towards me as well. I'm sorry, you guys. Is, is this any better? If it's sounds, not, it sounds a little better. Okay. Um, if if this is not good, if you could just wave at me, I will call in so that you can hear me. It, are you okay, Lisa? Thumbs up. I think it's easier if you call in. I think the voice will be better since this is your main, uh, your second major report. Okay. It's easier to hear. Bear with me a moment. Okay. Hmm. That's not going to be good. How's that? Is this better? I think so. It's not tinny, but it needs to be just a wee bit louder. Oh my gosh, you guys. Um, I, I'll try to project my voice a little bit more. Is this okay? This is working for me. Working now. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, right as I'm losing my voice, too. Okay, um, so as I was mentioning before, door counts. Um, since the library has reopened, um, I wanted to give you an update about our door counts. So um, on our first day, we averaged about 58 patrons an hour, and we had approximately half of what we would normally do on a full 12-hour day. Now, granted, we're only open eight hours during, during our time. So... We had 466 people visit the library on Monday the 13th, and that was our highest total so far. Since then, it has been in about the 300 to 350 range for our daily attendance. So um, that's been a very manageable number for us, and I think it reflects, um, you know, the, the patrons are, are, are recognizing that they are in the middle of a pandemic and they're continuing to get services in other ways, but also limiting the time that they're in the library. So we're averaging, as I said, about 40 patrons an hour with this, um, you know, somewhere in the three, 300 to 350 range, which is, which is generally good for us. So that's been, that's been great. Um, at the June meeting, we, we moved to uh, go fine free effective July 1, um, and that's been great for us so far. Beginning tomorrow, CCS and Innovative will be partnering to purge um, the, the first stage of uh, of outstanding fines on our patrons' cards. So um, the ones tomorrow that will be purged is anything that is a fine that's been on a patron's account from 2013 and back, all right? So seven years and older, um, these, uh, these will no longer be on a patron's account. And that, that also includes items that have been long um, billed. So if someone had a lost item or something that's been overdue for seven years, we're just gonna be done with it. And CCS is doing that for all 26 member libraries, not just for Wilmette Library. Then for all the libraries who went fine free and elected to have this service, um, each member library will have their patrons cards purged, purged of fines 
on Thursday the 23rd. So if any of you should happen to have a small fine on your card, by end of day on Thursday the 23rd, it should magically disappear. Um, I've got a 10 cent fine on my card, so I'm, I'm gonna watch that, and when that goes away, then I know it's been complete. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Any questions about being fine free? All right, um, I can give you an update on the Summer Reading Club. <clears throat> it's an unusual time for, for summer reading, obviously. Um, so far, we have had 338 kids that have been reporting for 10 days and 81 kids that have been reporting for 20 days. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, we're getting about 15 to 25 kids are reporting their, their reading um, to the library each day. And we're keeping track of that on the window outside of the media room. So if you go by the front of the library, there is a visual out there that reflects um, what the students' uh, participation has been in our program this year. Um, participation has been great so far in terms of the, uh, the prizes. There are good incentives. So um, thanks to the friends for supporting this. Uh, we've uh, just added 100 more uh, Dairy Queen gift certificates this, um, this week and 200 additional uh, gift certificates for the book stall. So again, thank you to the friends for, for that awesome partnership, um, and we're thrilled to be able to offer that. Um, we are, we are pus putting out um, lawn signs uh, to promote the summer reading program as well. Um, have any of you gotten any lawn signs to promote it at home? I would like to encourage you all to come by and grab one. And if you don't want to come by the library, guess what? I'll come by and bring it to your house. So if you would like one, just let me know. Um, there are a few that are on display outside of the library right now. A number of patrons have been uh, picking them up as well. Um, so we'll, um, I just want to remind you that those are available. Um, all right, so into my report, just wanted to touch on a couple things. Um, I'll hold this up. Here's a picture of the, the take-home um, steam kits. So that was on page two of my report as an example um, of, of some of the uh, maker type stuff that you can do at home. Uh, moving along in the director's report under the strategic plan updates, I just wanted to draw attention to one of the programs that we offered. Uh, on June 30th, Rachel Garcia hosted a program called the Montgomery Travelers, Discovery and Growth from Racial Inequality to Passion for True Justice. We had over 55 people attend this awesome program. Um, we're gonna continue to offer programming like this uh, in our efforts to try to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to reinforce the statement that we issued in early June. Uh, this is just part of our culture, and we're gonna continue to offer programming that supports this. Um, in objective 4.4, um, all librarians on staff uh, were encouraged to attend the virtual ALA conference and we had over 20 librarians that participated or library staff members participated in the program. Um, at the very tail end of my report, you will see a list of um, the types of workshops that they attended. Um, a lot of staff wrote reports and they got wonderful takeaways that they're gonna try to apply to their learnings this year and in their development of other programming and services going forward. So we're really thrilled about that. Uh, that's our highest success rate with any type of a, of a conference program attendance before. So the pandemic is good for some things like that. Um, in Objective 5.5, with relation to improving internal library communications, this month we implemented Microsoft Teams. Um, this has been a really awesome uh, communication tool. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it's essentially kind of like, kind of like Google Docs. Uh, and the whole Google Cloud suite of, of ops, but it's available through, um, uh, through Microsoft, which integrates with our Outlook and all of our Office software. It basically allows us to live chat with one another. Um, we can conference um, in place of Zoom. We can share documents in the cloud and actively edit things together. It's just been a wonderful collaborative and communication tool. Um, we're all still kind of learning it, and some folks are, are quicker to take onto it than others, but it's been really great so far. Moving on to the bottom of that page, when we get into our collections, our digital circulation continues to be really strong. Um, even though we're, we're open again, we're still seeing strong numbers posted in OverDrive. And I wanted to let you know that OverDrive um, has recently acquired RB Digital. 
Um, RB Digital is the platform that um, has long been uh, recorded books, as the RB is recorded books, so they were one of the uh, early pioneers in books on tape, audiobooks. Um, so that was an audiobook platform uh, that was available concurrent with OverDrive. OverDrive has acquired them. RB, RB also um, acquired Zinio uh, a while back, and Zinio was rolled into that suite. Zinio is a digital magazine um, platform, and now OverDrive is managing digital magazines, which I know has been a long part of their service model. That's one of the things that they have not offered. So with the integration of this, this uh, expanded audiobook platform and magazine platform, um, the library will have one less platform for patrons to have to navigate. It will radically simplify the way that we're able to offer digital services going forward. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, Overdrive is a very familiar name. Um, I know a lot of you are using the Libby app. Um, this will all be available as part of Libby once these things get more, more integrated. Uh, the news is still pretty fresh. I don't have a lot of detail about it to share right now, uh, but we're very much excited for the fact that Overdrive and RB Digital are, are merging. Um, <clears throat> on page seven of my report, you'll see that there's this, uh, this graphic of all these carts. Um, that was a pretty typical day um, in June. Um, when we first started circulating holds again and we're really ramping up our parking lot pickup to uh, allow patrons to be able to access the collections, we were processing thousands and thousands of materials a day. Um, and at that time, we were also manually making phone calls to all of the patrons so that they would be able to ask us questions and learn a little bit more about what our service model was while we were also telling them how they could take advantage of our new services uh, via the parking lot. It was a very time-consuming process, but the staff did a fabulous job with it, and I really want to give them credit for all the extra effort that they put into that. Um, that was a daily occurrence, thousands of materials. Um, today, June 20, or July 21st, um, Wilmette Library joined um, a number of other CCS libraries in expanding our intra-CCS loan. Well, I want to share this screen with you so that you can see which libraries are now participating in this if it lets me. Um, I don't know why it's not letting me do this. <laughs> Here we go. All right, um, so you can see that beginning today, the following libraries have opted to resume interlibrary intra-CCS loan. So that means that patrons of the Wilmette Library will now be able to place holds in the catalog and receive those materials from these libraries. This is a, this is a radically expanded um, offering of services that we're able to extend today. Um, before, patrons were really only able to get materials from Wilmette Library. Now they can get them from all of these libraries within CCS. So when you log into the catalog um, and place holds, any existing holds that are out there can now be trapped by any other member library that's, that's offering this service and the collections are now available at all these libraries to our patrons. So immediately in our service area, you can see that Glenview and Highland Park are up there, Morton Grove, Niles, um, and there we are, Wilmette, and Zion is kind of down here at the bottom. These, um, on a monthly basis, CCS will allow other libraries to join in intra-CCS loans. Um, so we'll, in a month, we'll see if there's anyone else that comes on in August and September. Um, but we're really excited about that. So what that means is um, that we can send and receive intra-CCS loans, um, that we're going to be doing our pick list at least once daily, and we do. We do it at least twice daily. Um, we get our Rails delivery bins uh, on a daily basis, and those have already doubled from what we've seen previously. So there's a lot of material getting circulated, and that we're going to continue to quarantine our materials in accordance with Rails guidance. So... Anyway, I wanted to share that detail with you. So when we see these carts and carts of books for our patrons, um, now other libraries are going to be helping to fulfill that process as well. Um, I gave an update on Summer Reading Club. Um, Joan had mentioned that she used our new uh, self-checkout machines. I've got a picture of those here for you too. Um, we have two new self-checkout machines that we approved uh, back in May. Uh, those were installed in early July, and the public has taken use of them so far. 
They're a lot easier to use than the old ones, and the cool thing is that they're also going to be forward compatible with our RFID system when we get that implemented later this fiscal year. Um, so one of those units is currently on top of the circulation desk, and the other one is um, where you used to find the coffee maker uh, right across from the recent arrivals desk. Um, we've talked about the facility a little bit more. I've got pictures of the facility in there, um, highlights from our social media campaign, and then um, under human resources, I've got some information to share. So as I mentioned earlier um, regarding payroll, we have had some turnover, um, and that was to be expected, that there was going to be a bit of that. So beginning in July, we did experience about a 10% reduction in force. And that has caused a whole host of other challenges for us, obviously, as we're trying to scale up and reopen the facility. Um, we are saying goodbye to a few staff members that have been with us for a long time who have elected to retire. Um, the first um, that is probably most familiar to you all um, is Cynthia McMillan. She, is, she um, was my administrative assistant, and she faithfully served the library for 21 years. Um, beloved staff member. We're sorry to see Cynthia go, but we're really thrilled for her and wish her all the best in retirement. One of these days when we're out of the pandemic, um, we're going we're gonna to go to dinner. Um, so, and then we can actually celebrate. Um, also retiring, uh, Barbara Goodman uh, in adult services. She's served us for 31 years. Um, she's an integral part of our um, One Book Everyone Reads program um, and has been a really great service to us as well. Um, Leslie Lightoff, who also served us for over 30-some years, um, retired a few years ago but came back as a sub, and she finally decided to retire, uh, retire, retire. <laughs> so um, we, we bid farewell to Leslie. And then um, we also are, are bidding farewell this Friday to circulation manager uh, Luciano Ward. Um, Luciano's been with us uh, for 18 years in his capacity, and obviously that's a big challenge for us as we're um, creating a lot of modifications in circulation um, right now. So that position is currently posted. Um, we're accepting applications right now through the end of the month. And um, it's an unusual time to be hiring for a manager, I'll say. Um, so we'll have to see what that interview and review process uh, goes like, but um, that position is out there as well. Um, so that's just a kind of a taste of what some of the things are that are going on personnel-wise at the library. Um, there's a lot more content in my report, so I'm going to pause there and see if you've got any questions for me. Anthony, one question for you. Um, for, for Luciano's position, will you be also interviewing uh, internal as well? Obviously. Um, we're, we're certainly open to that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or com oh Jan, I think you're muted. You're muted. You're still muted, Jan. There you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a question. The people on the list, are they already officially retired or are there um, a couple who are going to retire? Well, if you do the math, you can tell that when I say that there's 10%, but you see those numbers there, that that's not the complete list. So stay tuned. There's, there's more to come. Mm -hmm. So, but the question is the people on that list are already gone from the library essentially okay yeah hi this may be uh for a later board meeting um and apologies for my colleague in the background um but i um you know if we anticipate being in reduced capacity for a significant part of the coming year um and if now's not the time to answer it that's fine too anthony but how how do we sort of on the sort of just straight common sense approach sort of explain why we're you know at the same budget level if we anticipate our services 
might look like they did this year when we were closed for three or four months. I, I recognize that may be a much broader question. If now is not the time, that's fine. But that's sort of my uh, open question that I don't feel like I have a good answer for. Well, I think we have to plan accordingly for, for um, our full services. And that was our operating plan when we brought the budget forward um, in this early budget cycle in the spring. Um, we, we did discuss that at length in meetings this spring, I, I feel. Trustees, if you want to back me up on that, feel free. Um, but I, I think, you know, our, as part of our planning process, we wanted to make sure that we didn't limit um, unnecessarily any of the services that we would be able to offer. Um, so we want to prepare to be able to scale to this remote environment and to serve the public as directly as possible um, at the fullest of our capacity. And if we budgeted with any reduction in force, um, we would potentially be shooting ourselves in the foot and be ill-equipped to be able to deliver those services. So our methodology has been to um, prepare and uh, to offer the services as best as we can, as we can, and to adapt um, as needed. So that's kind of, that's what our plan has been. Um, obviously, you can't always anticipate when you're going to see a reduction in force like this in terms of retirement. Some of it is planned. Some of it's unanticipated. Um, people can come and go. Um, and we post and fill positions as, as soon as those vacancies appear. And we evaluate our staffing model and try to determine if there's other ways that we can do things differently, if that's a time to restructure or to rethink the way that we've been doing something. Um, there are a lot of factors that are at play there. So I think um, uh, when the board um, approved this budget, uh, the plan was that we wanted to try to keep things as consistent as possible and to be as adaptable as possible. And uh, I believe that the budget that we've approved uh, um, affords me the capability to do that. Anyone want to add anything to that? Just to, uh, Anthony, just to echo what you're saying, um, that we'll, at the budget meeting and in previous discussions, what we talked about was, again, in, in, in a way to best serve the whole broader community of WOMAD and, and, and Kenilworth members as well, um, to prepare for all eventualities. Um, obviously, we know that there's a chance that the virus is going to come back in a big way in the, in the fall and winter, but, but there's also chances that things play out in a different way, and we didn't want to shortchange the community by not being, as you said, prepared as best as possible, again, for all possibilities. So I think that's what the budget really is doing. Um, and you've been doing in terms of trying to structure the best kind of a game plan that's flexible. Um, and then as Trustee Johnson pointed out before, um, if, thing, if conditions get such that, that there's more and more um, reliance on virtual um, uh, public education in the school system, um, then what can the library do to kind of help to augment that? And that might involve some kinds of expenditures um, that I know we've been discussing that could then make the library um, more, uh, you know, more relevant and more in people's homes, even if it is a virtual, um, but still an expenditure driven kind of kind of effort. Another factor is that um, we have deferred implementation of the conversion of our collection to RFID for a number of years. Uh, we have anticipated in the coming year that if there is downtime, um, because of uh, um, uh, the limitation in hours that is result of the pandemic, that staff time could be a, a, uh, used effectively to complete that conversion. Um, RFID requires handling every item in the collection because it requires placing the uh, required uh, chips in every circulating item. So that's a very labor intensive activity that would be an effective use of staff time under these circumstances. So we have already anticipated um, proceeding with some things that would uh, allow us to catch up to um, libraries around us that made this conversion at considerably greater expense um, earlier. And so, you know, we have, we've already planned to take advantage of the availability of staff to focus on some of these sorts of projects uh, if the opportunity exists, as it may very well in the coming months. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about the director's report? <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, well that concludes my report then. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Barshi's the ILA update. Uh, just a, a couple of interesting things. Some of you may already know this, but uh, Carla Hayden announced today that Colson um, Whitehead, author of the Pulitzer Prize novels, The, Tick, the Nickel Boys and the Underground Railroad, will receive the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction during the 2020 Library of Congress National Book Festival in September. Whitehead is the youngest person at 50 to receive the Library's Fiction Award for his lifetime of work. His work is informed by probing insights into the human condition and empathy for those who struggle with life's sometimes harrowing vicissitude. He was selected as this year's winner based on nominations from more than 60 distinguished library literary figures, including former winners of the prize, acclaimed authors, and literary critics from around the world. The prize ceremony will take place online during the National Book festival. And there's a quote from him that was kind of interesting. As a kid, I'd walk into great New York City libraries like the Schomburg and the Mid-Manhattan on a field trip or for a school assignment and feel this deep sense of awe, as if I'd stumbled into a sacred pocket in the city. Whitehead said, I hope that right now there's a young kid who looks like me, who sees the Library of Congress recognized Black artists and feels encouraged to pursue their own vision and find their own sacred spaces of inspiration. We congratulate him as the Wilmette Library and hope he contributes many more books that we can read. Uh, the second thing is that uh, just a little note about Stacey Abrams who talks about libraries must tell the story of America. She is the daughter of a librarian and she really focuses on libraries and what they can do. Um, we need libraries to help us tell the truth about who we are, she said, a nation that promises opportunity but has struggled to make that promise well. To tell the truth effectively, she called on libraries to change organizational culture. People at the library have to be willing to see and accept everyone who calls on us. She says that librarians should not close themselves off to divisive opinions, but should amplify the messages they are unifying. Two of her projects are getting voting rights for as many people as possible and having the census count be real so that people don't get left out when the money is allocated. Uh, so it's important to educate the public on the importance of voting and the importance of the census. I, she thinks a lot of people really don't understand that. And those are the biggest stories. Okay. <laughs> Talked a little bit about rails. Do you have anything else to add, Director Austin? Um, I don't think I have anything else to add. Rails is having um, their uh, their monthly meeting um, uh, for members is on uh, Thursday. So we'll learn a little bit more about what Rails may do in response to the updated Realm study. Um, that I've referenced earlier to see if they're going to make an, um, any changes to their proposal regarding how long materials should be quarantined for. Um, otherwise, I, I don't think I have anything else to add. Um, if you go to Rails and, and click on the, their COVID tab, which is the first tab you'll see on the left-hand side of their page, um, you can learn more about what Rails is doing to be responsive to the virus right now for system members. Do you have any comments? Additionally, since we had communication in terms of uh, comments and suggestions that you've received? Um, I, I think we've received a lot of very positive feedback from the public. Um, so, I mean, it far outnumbers anything that we've received um, in terms of complaints about limited services, in terms of not being able to, to linger in the library or read newspapers or sit in comfy chairs and so on. Um, a lot of folks are just happy to see that the library is back open again. 
And I think that a lot of that has to do with the library is, is kind of a symbol of community. And the fact that um, when the public library reopens, um, that's, that kind of symbolizes that there's some, some hope, I think, um, regarding what's going on in our society right now and that there's still opportunity that's afforded to folks. So um, I think that we're, we're serving that purpose for a lot of people right now. Um, and they're thrilled to have access to the collections again because I think that's kind of a physical representation um, of the freedom that they enjoy through uh, the freedom to read and view. So that's, I guess, the point that I would make right now is that I think a lot of folks are, have been telling staff just how happy they are to be able to come back in, browse the collections, get stuff, and, um, and feel educated and entertained. Okay. Thank you. And I saw, and your numbers were incredible with the virtual program, so look forward to yeah. seeing those. Okay. As a requirement of the Illinois Public Library annual report, the board's minute audit committee is required to view, review minutes of the WPL Board of Trustees prior to the August meeting. Trustee Fishman and Trustee Riddle are on the uh, audit committee. And uh, what the, I'm suggesting that you call Marty in the, in, uh, the office and she will get the minutes together and just make an appointment and you can do it individually. And I'll contact Trustee Riddle. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay. Is there any new business? Just want to confirm the time for our next meeting on August 18th. And there will be a hearing at 545. So in case anybody wants to get into the library, they can get into it. And, be, and Anthony will be the one that's present in the library in case they for the, uh, have any questions or any comments regarding our uh, DNA. And so the meeting will be at six and will be via Zoom. And the reason we have it at six is because in the middle of the day, it's even though it may be convenient for some of us that six o'clock is a compromise so that if you're working, you can attend, but it's not too late if it goes later. Okay, I would just ask why, if we're not meeting in person, I mean, I was told we moved it to six. You can hear my background noise it's with uh, kids and dinner. But um, I guess since we're doing it virtually, it seemed like 7.30 um, was what we were all accustomed to. And the, uh, since we're not in person, I guess I just don't understand why we're moving it to six. So it's much more convenient for me, but if that makes more sense for everybody else, then so be it. I think some of the trustees want it earlier, like in the middle of the day, because sometimes the meetings go longer. Do any of the other trustees want to talk about preferences or their thoughts? How about you? That's fine. Okay. Okay. Any other business? that someone wants to be, and we'll note that it's 730. Mm -hmm. Oh, could I add one thing, Lisa? Yes. Um, I forgot, I had one more report that I was gonna give that was just very interesting from the ILA, and that is that it's a human library where people, instead of traditional books, are on loan to readers. You can walk in, borrow a human being, and talk to them about a challenging issue or whatever else you would like to that, that they have expertise in. Just a new idea to throw out. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? No, just, I, well, Lisa, in terms of the timing of the board meetings, I know you had sent out the doodle poll, and at least from what I witnessed, um, everybody who responded to the doodle poll indicated that sometime between 10 and 6 p.m was best um, and that certainly is my situation and it seemed to be the same thing for everybody else who did i know there were two board members who for some reason did not respond to the doodle poll but for those who did that was consistent uh, both for for the board members as well as for director austin so mm -hmm. uh, that that seemed to be very very clear and, and the clear majority uh, that way um and then secondly or finally i just want to say too that i um i've um had the good fortune of talking to some some members of other libraries in the, in the area and Anthony, um, everybody has had some small bumps or adjustments because of the flexibility that has to be shown in terms of being virtual and being kind of a remote service kind of center and then reopening. Um, and I must say, in, in sharing stories, um, well, Matt certainly rises to the top in terms of 
how well things uh, seem to be going both internally and, and externally from, from the community. So I just wanted to say thank you for that again. Yeah. I, would, I would agree with that same experience. And I think the other thing is at one point, Director Austin was the only one in the library. And so with some of my, our meetings when they were later, he would be leaving quite late yeah. after a long day. So that was another consideration. But thank you. Any other business? I guess you guys just bought a lot of kids in the next Zoom meeting, but that's okay by me then. Okay, do what you gotta do. All right. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting at 7.26? I will sell a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Trustee Wolf has motion to adjourn the meeting at 7.26. Trustee Fishman has seconded it. And there can be a roll call vote on this one. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting's adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Lisa.